Welcome to the Medical Device Made Easy podcast. Here is Munir Alazuzi from easymedicaldevice.com. And today we'll do the November update. So what happened this month and what will happen in the few, in the few next uh, months or ne next weeks. So, um, we will start first with, um, the situation on MDR and IVDR. Uh, so first we have, um, as always, an update of the implementing uh, rolling plan that is issued by the EU Commission. Not too much surprises inside um, for regarding what happened last month. Uh, there are a lot of things that are already completed. And uh, what we are looking at specifically actually is the line related to the uh, common specification for non-medical devices. So the Annex 16 products. And actually this was moved, moved, moved. And now this is uh, in Q2, if I remember, Q2 2020, uh, Q1 2022. Um, so we expect that then uh, later. Uh, but remember one thing, um, Later is better. More uh, we are waiting for that, uh, then later those products will be uh, placed on the market uh, under MDR. And the reason is mainly because uh, there is um, a clock that will start as soon as those common specifications will be published. This clock says what? This clock says that as soon as this is published, all those manufacturers that have a non-medical purpose device um, color um, uh, uh, contact lenses with just to color your eyes or um, adipose liposis, liposuction t, uh, machines or other machines that are doing for that uh, all those equipments will then become medical devices and they will have six months from the date this is published to then apply the umdr which is I'm, I must say a challenge, but first, because as the common specification are not published, there are maybe some details that we don't know uh, that those manufacturers have to apply. Uh, we don't know, we'll see. And as soon as it is published, it means that they have to have a notified body that is uh, planned, that they can come, they can audit you, etc. They can give you a certificate, which I find nearly impossible. I don't know what will be the result, but for me, it's really something that is impossible. Uh, I have some customers that have planned some audits that got their audits that were all fine. And it took them six months after the audit to reserve the uh, CE certificate. So I'm not sure exactly how it's working, but it's why I'm saying later is better. So later the command specification is published, better it is. Maybe at that time, notified bodies will have less stress uh, to be fine, but maybe not. This is also the point because uh, in Q1 2022, there will be also the IVDR that will start. We'll talk also about that I mean, after Q1 2022, but yeah, everything is arriving at the same time. So uh, it will be really a difficult situation. So if you are in under the Annex 16, uh, I recommend you to start immediately to have all your documentation ready to have a chance to be, to get audited and certified um, within the six months to just have a chance it's even not sure but if you are not doing anything for sure you'll not be able to make it at all so this is the advice for today then the next topic uh, is mainly the IVDR. I'm, maybe you haven't heard, but <laughs> maybe you have heard. Uh, the EU Commission has issued a proposal uh, to move the transition period, let's say transition periods with the S at the end. Uh, it's not a postponement. So people are saying, oh, IVDR is postponed, IVDR is postponed. No, it's not a postponement. It's just moving some dates uh, related to the uh, in vitro diagnostic uh, regulation for the, some products. So for example, all class A device that will be class A, uh, like similar to class one under uh, UMDR, uh, which are self-certified, those products will have to apply UMDR uh, immediately, 26th of May, 2022. Then class B will be one year later, class C, class D, uh, etc. will be later. So it will be gradually in place but uh, remember one thing, this is only a proposal. We'll see if, the, if there is some approvals about it, if there will be some implementation, if the implementation will be on time, if everything will be fine. But this is only an appro uh, a proposal. If you want to hear more about it, so we have made an episode with Eric Volbrecht, so podcast episode, the last one, uh, the previous one, where we talked specifically about that. Uh, Eric made also the, a graph that you can see, uh, you can download directly on the uh, on the show notes where it tells you exactly for which product at which date exactly it will be applicable uh, so that it can be 
uh, maybe more understandable for you. But this means that uh, the EU Commission understood the kind of catastrophe that is will happen if they are not doing any uh, something. So for that, uh, so it's why. It's a good news, if I can say, for, for manufacturers. But manufacturers should also start now also to move forward. And what we ask the EU Commission, if I can say, is to uh, permit to more notified bodies to get uh, certified. We'll look later about the situation of notified bodies. But um, yeah, it's, uh, it's not enough, actually, for IVDR. But I hope with this, uh, it will be helpful. So the EU Commission also explained a bit uh, why uh, this... Um, this uh, this transition, this addition of transition period. So many, they mentioned about the fact that uh, the resources were mainly um, diverted to the COVID-19 uh, situation. The notified bodies, there are not too much. And there is also a delay on some products uh, to be on the, on, the, on the market. So it's mainly something that is um, understood by them. They are really uh, aware now of the situation. And we hope that this um, excess or this delay that will be provided will help the manufacturers, but also help notified bodies to uh, get uh, accredited, then they can help all the manufacturers. Okay, now um, the NSM uh, is um, publishing an information about products that contain cobalt. So if you have some products that contain cobalt, uh, you have to understand that since October 1st, 2021, uh, all those products uh, are considered containing some CMR. If the cobalt is at 0.1% weight uh, by weight, then this is, con this is becoming on the list of CMR. Uh, so carcinogen, mutagen, and uh, toxic for reproductibility, uh, then you have to act the same as what if for any product that is under CMR and uh, that is has to follow the UMDR. So we have also made a podcast episode recently. So it's funny because we have all those topics coming and at the same time we have made episodes about that. So we have made an episode with Anna Luitza uh, Kassindouz uh, talking specifically about CMR and the fact that uh, you have a specific section on the uh, Annex 1 chapter 2, uh, 10.4, where you talk specifically about the um, requirements for uh, products that contain CMR. So you can go there and you can check exactly what you have to do, but um, you have also the cheer guideline that is talking to you about the fact that if it contains CMR, so is there any benefit risk? So you have to make this analyze because if it contains CMR, but there is no justification for it, then maybe your products will not be authorized anymore on the market. So you have also to take care about that or to have a justification why this CMR substance may be more beneficial than provoke some risks for, for the patient. And this is something that is really, really important. So you can go on the show notes and you will see the... The French, the NSM page, so if you read French, it's there, where it's take, explaining exactly about that. So the legislation is the legislation 2020-2017, and it talks specifically about uh, this inclusion of cobalt uh, inside this list and, and the consequence for, for your products. Okay, we were talking about that last time. So Udamed has up been updated. Now we have new information about that we can include inside. Uh, so in uh, December 2020, we had the possibility to include the economic operators, so manufacturers, importers, distributors, service pack providers, authorized representatives. So um, now in October 2021, uh, there was a, a big update where we can now include devices and certificates. So I have looked inside and there was already a lot of manufacturers that start to place devices uh, there. Uh, device name with the UDI uh, codes, a basic UDI, DI code, etc. So, um, which is interesting because it's the first time I can see a list where all medical devices are approved. But remember, it's voluntary only for now. There is, it's not mandatory. And you have a, a third, if I can say, module that was also uh, in place, which is a certificate. Mainly, it will explain which certificate, which manufacturer got a certificate, which certificate is valid. You can even place, the uh, when you receive a certificate, you can place the certificate number on the UDAMED and it will tell you, yes, this certificate exists and it, ha it, has, it has been approved. But uh, yeah. The notified body have to do this upload if I can send the system and I didn't saw so much. I tried to find some, but I didn't find anything. So maybe, yeah, as I say, it's a voluntary. So maybe they have other things to do than just to upload those certificates for the moment. But for sure it will be done. You will have all the certificates that will be published and public so that you can see that by yourself. 
Okay, so now team NB. So team NB is working hard. We have two two um, uh, position papers. So the first position paper is a proposal for the notified body opinion template uh, for the article 117. So you remember that with article 117, uh, so manufacturers that are placing on the market uh, drug device combination products, so with an integral part. So even if the product is a drug, uh, as it contains a device, the device part should be assessed by a notified body. And here, the objective of this document or this proposal is to explain exactly what element will be reviewed, how it will be provided, what are the questions that can be answered, etc. So I look at this document, it's really interesting. So if you are in this uh, business, maybe it's interesting for you to understand exactly what are the information that they will be looking at. For example, they will check uh, Annex 1 if you are following the first chapter, the second and the third chapter, all the information about the justification for each of those, etc. etc. So uh, you can look specifically on this uh, on the show notes and you will see uh, this template and you read that. So. It's a proposal again, so it's team NB that made this proposal, but for sure, I suppose this will be also the, the final version or, or maybe a, just a draft, which will be a bit modified, but the information inside are really accurate, so I think it's a good one. So have a look and a check if you are on this business to see if um, you are complying to those requirements specifically. Then the second proposal from team NB is about the European Artificial Intelligence Regulation. So, we talked about that with Aptin Rad when we had this episode with Aptin Rad, where we mentioned specifically about the fact that um, there is a new regulation that is in progress now, that is um, drafted for artificial intelligence. And we talked about the fact that it's a parallel procedure with the medical devices, and you maybe have to have two notified bodies if the, the one that you have is not able to do both, etc. etc. So Team NB is making some advice or some, some suggestion. Uh, first, on the definition of AI. So they say mainly that the definition that is mentioned on this regulation is too broad, which can include a lot of software that are even not uh, with AI, with artificial intelligence. So it's uh, an advice just to maybe make it more uh, more accurate so that we are really focusing only on artificial intelligence. Um, also the fact that um, there are medical, there, there is the medical device under Artificial Intelligence Act. And here um, there is a development of a specific a suggestion that we can develop a specific uh, medical device regulation for artificial intelligence, uh, which will be more, uh, if I can say, focused on the healthcare, on all those software that are specifically for healthcare. Because yeah, if we include all the artificial intelligence products in the same regulation, maybe there will be things that would be applicable to uh, uh, medical devices, but things that are not applicable at all to medical devices. So here the proposal is to make something that is maybe more specific to medical devices. Uh, we have again the reporting and vigilance. So if there is an issue with the artificial intelligence, here the objective is to say, can we harmonize all that instead of saying maybe, oh, if you have a, a medical device and Contents and, uh, which contains an artificial intelligence. Um, if it's a medical device and there is an issue, you should report maybe after 10 days. But if, it is, if it's an artificial intelligence, you have to report within 20 days uh, to another agency. So the idea here is to say, can we maybe harmonize that, have one way to do it instead of manufacturers going to many directions, etc. So, And this is um, one of their, their things. About also the conformity assessment with notified bodies. Um, is, does notified body need to be uh, accredited? Uh, for, uh, for get an accreditation for that or not, etc. So this is also something where they want also some harmonization. So uh, Team NB is making some proposals, um, some for regarding the, the legislation, and to see if we can make it more simple, more harmonized, and that can be suitable for everybody, which is good also for manufacturers. I imagine manufacturers, they don't want to have two type of system, two type of documentation, two type of centers to report or whatever. It's better to have one way to do it and then everybody will be on the, on the safe side. Yeah, medical device is already complicated. <laughs> let's not make it more complicated. Okay, now uh, let's go to the UK, uh, UK MHRA, where uh, they had a, a collaboration or a discussion with also the US and Canada uh, to discuss also about uh, artificial intelligence. And they have defined the 10 guiding principles for AI software. So it looks like the 10 commandments <laughs> for things. I will read that to you, but mainly yeah, it looks really like that. I should maybe make the music of the 10 commandments and <laughs> talk to you with a tablet <laughs> on it. 
So uh, first it says that multidisciplinary expertise is leveraged throughout the total product life cycle um, of, the, of, the, of the software. Uh, the good software engineering and security practices are implemented that clinical study participants and data sets are representative of the intended patient population, that training data sets are independent of test sets, selected reference data sets are based upon best available methods, that model design is tailored to the available data and reflects the intended use of the device, focus is in place uh, on the performance of the human AI team. So testing demonstrates device performance during clinically relevant conditions, users are provided clear essential information, and deployed models are monitored for performance and retraining risks are managed. So I don't understand all of this <laughs> mainly, but mainly here it's explaining exactly maybe the golden rules that uh, any manufacturer should uh, should develop for uh, for the the good uh, modeling model for uh, artificial intelligence, uh, which I hope will be implemented. But for now, we see that with UK, US, and Canada, maybe there will be there is an idea here to make it more global uh, so that everybody can follow that. And maybe this is also f following, if I can say, the the elements that uh, the team NB was talking about. Um, to make it more harmonized. So it's also something that uh, is interesting to, to look at. But yeah, there are those 10 uh, guiding principles. We'll see exactly how it will look like after that. So if you want to read more about those principles, you can go on the, on the show notes and I placed uh, the links from the UK government about, about this element. So uh, I just want to remind you that uh, the UK uh, still has its uh, new or future medical device regulation and your consultation. You have until the 25th of November uh, to provide your advice. They have just updated the page. Uh, it's included now, uh, which are the webinar links. So you can see the webinar that they have made uh, about this uh, consultation uh, or the, this new regulation. So to have maybe a better understanding. So I advise you to go again to this page and to find the videos of those uh, webinars. If so, this will help you maybe to look at some of the elements that were uh, discussed, uh, explained, and maybe justified also uh, on the on the publication. So. Um, Go to the show notes also and you'll find the link there. Then UK MHRA is also making an alert here on the um, infusion pumps uh, T34 uh, from BD. Uh, so many they are making uh, information about the issues that are happening and they are uh, alerting all the hospitals, all the people that are using that. There are actually some battery issues, some floor related issues, some sunlight causing uh, bolus uh, infusion, some fluid increase. So um, they are also explaining that you have really to follow the instruction of the manufacturers. There is a discussion ongoing with uh, Beckton Dickinson for this, uh, but mainly uh, there, there is a, a clear information here about the different issues. So if you are using those type of infusion pump, the T T34, then maybe it's good to go and to look at that uh, and uh, to understand that. So mainly this is for hospitals or clinics. I hope they are hearing that, or maybe if you know some hospitals or clinics that are using that. So mainly uh, this is an alert from the UK MHRA. Then uh, the UK MHRA is also holding a, a public uh, board meeting, uh, a webinar also that will be um, in November 16th uh, at 11, 11, uh, one, uh, 11 a.m., uh, between 11 a.m. and 1 uh, uh, p.m., 1.30 p.m. Uh, CET time. So um, you can also go to the show notes to see the event and to register for it. Uh, so mainly they will be having, you can also ask your question there. So there is also a procedure to uh, post your question so that they can maybe answer to that during the, the session. So do that in advance. So it will be November 16th uh, at 11 uh, a.m. CET time. Then we have a publication from uh, Turkey. Uh, so we talked about Turkey uh, because of Turkzit. On the um, 26th of May 2021, we had the information about the fact that Turkey has signed an agreement with Europe for EU MDR. So the fact that uh, Turkey will follow EU MDR uh, for the products and that they can then uh, place devices on the market without having an importer in Turkey, without having an authorized representative in Turkey. Now uh, they have just published the same document for IVDR. So they are mentioning the fact that they have also an agreement 
um, with the EU uh, Commission for IVDR. So it's good because it's not published just at the moment of uh, the 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 yeah the, the, of IVDR that is in place. It's published earlier so that we know that. So now we know that there is not sure exit for IVDR also that will be happening. So it's a good news. So you can see also those documents in English in uh, the show notes directly. Okay, Philippines now. So let's go a bit to Asia. We start with Philippines. And here we talk about uh, uh, FDA uh, circular that was issued for re retailers uh, of medical devices. So um, before it was maybe fine for retailers to sell medical devices uh, without registration. But apparently there was too much um, uh, issues uh, done with that. So now um, the Philippine, the FDA in the Philippines is asking specifically uh, for retailers to have a license uh, to sell medical devices. So those that are in scope of that are retail stores or clinics, uh, sellers uh, using online shopping websites, operators of medical devices, vending machines, uh, optical shops, uh, drug outlets or as drug stores. So all those have now to have a license within the Philippines for that. So if you are selling your products in the Philippines, uh, so maybe there will be some impact for you because there can be some delay between the time that they got the license and that they can be able to sell again their product. So um, yeah, just for your information, this is in case you have uh, some market in the Philippines that there, are, there can be this problem and this is the reason why. And now between um, Thailand and uh, Singapore, they have created what we are calling a regulatory reliance program. So um, they have issued a, a, a document saying that if uh, you are uh, selling your products in Thailand or in Singapore, uh, then you can uh, have a benefit from this program to be on the other market quicker. So mainly uh, it's uh, an agreement to make it cheaper and quicker so that uh, you, the products that are sold in Thailand can be going to Singapore and the products that are already sold in Singapore can go also to Thailand uh, in, a, in a better way. So this document is also important uh, because if you are uh, selling your products already in one of those countries, you can benefit from the program so that you can then go to the other market quickly. But uh, yeah, it's uh, also something that maybe you will need some local people to help you uh, because always, as always, there is a need some time of uh, authorized representative in the region. Uh, so have some, some input of that. There is the document specifically where it says how you can apply to it, how what is exactly the scope and the benefits. So it tells also how much it will cost because it says uh, the cost in bats. I don't know the conversion in euros, uh, but mainly it will tell you exactly uh, if, you, if you can benefit from this or not. And the last country of Asia, we talk about Japan. So Japan, uh, what is great in Japan is that um, if you are looking to learn or understand how you can place your device uh, in Japan, they have created an online page where uh, there is a lot of documentation courses, if I can say to webinars, to understand how medical devices are sold in, uh, are registered, uh, so the regulation in Japan, not only medical devices, also pharmaceutical and others. So I just placed a few pages on the show notes where you can go and you can have um, all the documents that are needed specifically for the registration of your products in Japan. Uh, it's in English. So uh, I didn't look at all, but the one I looked at were in English. Uh, so yeah, it's also something that maybe can be helpful because uh, sometimes when we look at the PMD uh, website, uh, a lot of things are in Japanese, uh, which makes it a bit difficult. But this one yeah, is in English, so it can help you a lot. So yeah, if you are really willing to um, go to the market, to the Japanese market, maybe having an introduction of the rules, the legislation can be also interesting so that when you are contacting your uh, marketing authorization holder there, uh, your authorized representative, then you have a better understanding of what exactly is needed. And remember that Japan is also under MDSAP. So if you are under the MDSAP program, then there are a lot of things that are also mentioned under the MDSAP for how to register your device in, in Japan. Okay, so events. Uh, so this month, uh, the event that, so we talked a lot about the previous events uh, with MedTech Summit recently, uh, who are part of the, of this one, uh, and uh, also uh, with, uh, with the Bahrain uh, GCC MedTech uh, meeting. And this month, there is another event. I never heard about this one, but apparently it, uh, it's existing. So it's uh, ACRAS, which is uh, stating for Aesthetic and Cosmetic Regulatory Affairs. It's a summit that is for Middle East. And um, what would be interesting here is to talk specifically 
you about the Annex 16 products. So I will be part of the second day where I will be, to, I will be explaining to manufacturers or to regulators that are there about the uh, Annex 16 uh, regulation, about the what I talked at the beginning about the common specification, the fact that you have to be quick uh, to have your documentation available uh, so that maybe you can be certified on time, etc. So this is mainly what we, I'll try to warn uh, all, the, all the audience. I hope they will understand because what the difficulty is that um, all the manufacturers that are, I mean, majority of the manufacturers that are under Annex 16, uh, they have no clue about the medical device regulation. They don't know how to get audited, what is an audit, what is an auditor, etc. So it's really a difficult situation for them, but I will try to help just by providing some information on that. So if you are a part of it, so it's great. So uh, I, th I will place also a link on the show notes if you want to register and to be part of that. If you're on this business, maybe also having some connection with Middle East, is, uh, it can be also interesting. So uh, go to the show notes to see the link. Okay, so notified bodies. So we talked a lot about notified bodies before uh, regarding IVDR, but for the moment, we have just good news for MDR again. We have a new uh, notified body under MDR, uh, which is uh, Certi Quality, Certi Quality SRL from Italy. Uh, so this is a, a new notified bodies, a new notified body. But um, the problem is that, is that when there is a new notified body, they will say, oh yeah, it's great, there is a new notified body. And when we are starting to look at what kind of products they can certify, we say, oh, only that. Uh, so with Certi Quality, for example, I looked at specifically what kind of products they can certify. And there are four active medical device regulation codes, and there are 13 non-active medical device regulation codes. For example, if you are a software company, you cannot get certified by uh, Certi Quality. So this is also the thing that is important. It's why I want to warn you, even if there is a notified body that is MDR certified, you still have to check if this notified body can certify your type of product. So you have to look at the MDR code and go there and check specifically if your product is there, if the, if your product is listed there. If it is not, then don't need, don't spend time or don't waste time to contact this notified body because he cannot help you. Even him, he will tell you. But maybe before that, he will put you on waiting list or you, you'll try to call him many, many times. So make your first uh, due diligence check and you'll verify and you'll see that maybe he cannot even help you at all. So it's better to have, to be aware before. Then the overall situation. So you can see the graph, the famous graph with all the columns. I'm a bit, yeah, I'm trying to understand again this, this graph. So, um, because there is, for example, six, uh, notified bodies in each for IVDR, for example, in each, uh, nearly each column, there is a seven at a time, there is a 12, etc. So what does it mean exactly? Is there six at this stage or it's six that passed this stage? It's mainly the, the point because, uh, I see that on the previous stage before the end on notified bodies, there is only six for the four or five phases. So does it mean that there is no additional notified body under IVDR that will be certified soon? I mean, it's something that uh, maybe need clarification, but actually, yeah, there is not too much. There is uh, for IVDR, there is six notified bodies. And for MDR, there is 24. Uh, so it's, um, yeah, nearly nothing. So, um, I hope, yeah, we will move forward quickly. I still have a lot of manufacturers that contacts me and tells me, yeah, um, I am on a waiting list for a notified body. Um, or we try to contact them and they don't answer, etc., etc. So it's a difficult situation and you have to understand that. Uh, yeah, you, you have, you, you, you should not start um, nearly uh, the, when when the, your certificate will be over. Uh, I have some manufacturers that are starting now with their certificate will be over in 2022, uh, in February 2022. It's nearly impossible for them to get certified on time. And this is mainly what is yeah, a bit dangerous for business because then you cannot sell your products at all. Okay, guidances. So we have three guidances this month. Uh, last month, I think we had nothing uh, from MDCG. So we have three guidances. And the first one is one of these uh, guidance that was uh, weighted. We were all waiting for that. So mainly it's the uh, classification guidance, which is the MDCG 2021-24, uh, which is replacing then the MedDev 2.41 revision 9, uh, which was the one that we were using before. So it's the same format, exactly the same explanation of classification. Uh, 
classification, how it should be classified, different definitions, what does it mean, etc. And then uh, the different uh, graphs that are talking about class one, rule one, what is the different uh, classification that comes out of it, etc. etc. So it's really a guidance that I, I advise you to read, to look at. Um, what is also good, and it's what they have done also before, and they have made the table with the different rules and class, but also some examples of devices, which helps a lot because just with the control F, so when you are searching on the page, search for your device and you'll find immediately maybe your device inside the, the, these columns and then you'll see which classification is for your device. So just control F, put like pacemaker and you'll find maybe a pacemaker and you'll know exactly which rule is applicable for that. You'll not have all the products, it's just examples, but sometimes it helps a lot. So uh, yeah, don't hesitate to go to this one. Then we have the MDCG 2021-25, which is talking about legacy devices. So mainly, what is a legacy device? Um, is a device uh, placed on the market before the 26th of May 2021 considered a legacy device? Uh, after, is it a legacy device? So there is a lot of questions like that. So mainly, um, this is trying to answer that. It's talking also about a task force that is helping you to understand, um, to answer your question about that. So um, I suppose this guidance is not finished or if it's finished, it's just uh, a small a small document that is uh, having an action to send uh, some information to the MDCG group. So maybe there will be a new one or an update or something new that will be coming out of that. So here the answer, the question is mainly uh, about legacy devices. So if you don't have any legacy devices, so then it's not really uh, anything interesting for you. And we have then the MDC 2021-26, which is talking about Article 16, uh, importer and distributor question and answer. So we had a previous one that was talking about also Article 16.4, uh, uh, about notified bodies for Article 16.4 for importers and distributors. And here it's talking about, uh, again, about Article 16, specifically about some questions that people are asking about uh, the relabeling, repackaging, for, or, for example, it says that hospitals, when they are getting a product and they are cutting it or making it on multiple small boxes to send that, uh, if I can say, to the, their hospital. So uh, this is not a repackaging or relabeling because it's not selling. Here we talk about selling uh, as soon as you are selling your products to an, uh, other distributors. And for that, you are relabeling or repackaging, etc. Then this is applicable to you. If you are an hospital that buy those products and then cut it to, to different services, this is not applicable to that. So this is an example, but there is a lot of uh, questions that are asked there so and then some answers that can help you so don't hesitate if you are in this case importer or distributor uh, that is doing some relabeling repackaging this uh, guidance will answer all your questions so then we talk about podcasts so uh, what are the latest podcasts so i nearly uh, talked about them just before but let's uh, have a quick review the first one is um, uh, episode 149 which is udamed update we talked uh, with richard julian about uh, the new um, the new version of the udamed with the uh, device registration and uh, with certificate so he is mentioning to us uh, he tells he, tell, he told us all the information that he had about that so you uh, uh, Richard Julian is um, uh, is uh, driving the udamed.com website, which is helping specifically about Udamed registration, Udamed training, etc. So if you have any question about Udamed, Richard will be your guru for that. Then next episode, episode 150, where we talked about CMR substances. So we mentioned that before. So um, Anna uh, Luitsa Kassindouz so helped us to understand uh, what are the rules for CMR under MDR, what you should do, uh, what you should mention on the label, etc., etc. So uh, all the things that are really important in case you are, have some CMR substances. But first, before maybe you have to evaluate, do you have CMR substance? And then if you say yes, then you have maybe to look at that, at, at what is uh, what are the requirements under Annex One, Chapter Two, Ten Point Four. Then we have Episode One Hundred and Fifty One. Uh, with uh, Eric Volbrecht, where we talked about the IVDR uh, transition periods. So IVDR, is IVDR postponed? The answer is no, because it's not like the same as MDR. It's not like we had the COVID and we postponed of one year. No, here uh, IVDR will be in place the 26th of May 2022, but depends on your classification. The date of application will be each time uh, defined Pair, uh, pair, uh, pair the, the classification of product. Remember, this is still a proposal, so this is not something that will be uh, in place uh, maybe soon. So maybe we'll hear about that 
the next few months before we get an approval and then a vote about, about this element. Okay, so it was really a pleasure to have uh, this episode with you. Uh, after Halloween, because we'll have that after Halloween, uh, I, I wish just a happy Diwala for all my uh, colleagues and all my, uh, all my the people that are listening to this uh, episode in India. So happy Diwala and hope you will have a, a great holiday. So everyone, I wish you a nice day and talk to you soon.